Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Say God is good. God is good. Say God knows. God knows. I don't know. I don't know. But God knows. But God knows. Praise the Lord. Amen. Faith. Amen. Just a little bit of faith. Right. Brother, I'm on microphone number nine if you need to know that. I'm good, Pastor. Thank you. Sister Creasy, thank you for the privilege of being able to teach today, Pastor, for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to stand before you. I don't take lightly what we do when we come here. When we open the pages of God's Word and we seek to understand what God's will for our lives is, is very important. It's very important for people that live in our day and time especially, but of all times, to realize there is a God. He's left a word for us, and He's intent on encouraging us. Even through dark and difficult times, the Word of God will encourage you if you will allow it to do so. You can read about Christians of all ages or those of the Jewish faith that were persecuted, and they were persecuted desperately for their faith. And you can see that we're not alone. We can read their stories, and we can take comfort in their stories. We can see how they dealt with adversity, and I will tell you, it all goes back to one concept, their unbreakable faith in God. They had faith in God even when they could not see Him. Even when the world was a very dark and desperate place, they knew their God would provide and their God would save them. It may not be next week, it may not be next year, but God would come through. And so the unbreakable and unshakable faith of the saints that came before us is what gives me comfort today to know that I can read their stories on the pages of God's Word and I can celebrate when they celebrated shed a tear when they shed tears but all in all know that god loves me and he knows what's best for me and that perfect love cast out all fear because my father is going to do what he said he would do thank you, Jesus. let's pray together thank gracious you. heavenly father we love you and we thank you for this privilege today to be here together we pray god that you will anoint this place that you will touch every heart in this place and that god you will touch each one that we might leave this place comforted and encouraged that we might learn your word, yes. and that we might be inspired by it. Yes. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so very much for standing. You may be seated. Faith. The concept today I would like to talk to you about is faith. Now the title of our lesson is Unexpected Ways. And we're going to look at God working in very unexpected ways. The hand of God moving sometimes what appears to be in secret some have the vision, some don't have the vision. But ultimately, those with faith, they step out and they trust God. In the Old Testament, you don't see the word faith much because the Old Testament concept of faith is the word trust. I trust God. And because I trust God and I know God, I will do what God's word asks me to do. Even under the most difficult of circumstances, even during the trials of my faith, I will not lose faith because my God has never failed me. The Bible says God cannot lie and God cannot fail. And if you can put your faith in God, then you will see him in very real and magnificent ways. We have read and heard testimony over this pulpit of men, women, missionaries, preachers, that God has fed them. They've, we've heard about people that didn't know where their next meal would come from, but God provided. We've heard of God raising people from the dead in our modern times. We've heard of people that exhibited faith in which they saw cancers fall off of their bodies. They saw miracles and healings in our modern day. But ultimately, it takes faith, the belief that God can and that God will, in order for us to realize the power of God in our lives. I'd like to begin reading today. I'm going to read the lesson text. You may be seated, but it's 2 Kings 7, 3 through 9. It says, And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, listen to what they said, why sit here until we die? Why do we just sit here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and then we'll, we'll die there. There's no food in the city. And if we sit here, we will die also because we have no food here. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. They're saying we have nothing to lose. There's no food in the city. There's no food in this leper's colony. If we go to the Syrians, that's the only chance we've got. 
They may go ahead and kill us and put us out of our misery. And the thought of approaching the enemy during these desperate times is very fearful. But they said, what other opportunity do we have? What other chance do we have? They have food. We don't. We're going to starve to death. We're dying of a deadly skin disease. But we're hungry. What are we going to do? And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. These lepers were out in a very common place. They knew that place. That was a place they had lived all of their lives since they had been diagnosed with this deadly disease. If you read in Leviticus, you will see that they had to be quarantined, that when they came in the presence of healthy people, they had to cry out unclean. They knew what it was like to be rejected and despised. They had been rejected and despised most of their lives. Here they were in a very common place, a place of comfort, a place of security, a place they had grown to become accustomed to. But they finally decided that I'm just going to sit here and die. I have to do something different. I've got to get out of my comfort zone. I must be willing to lead, to follow, to go out into a place where I may very well die. But what other opportunity do I have? I'm going to die here if I don't do so. And then these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, and they went into one tent, and they had a feast. They ate and drank. They carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went, and they hid it. And they came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. And they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning, lights of mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. They get there and their fears were not realized. They get there and, and just imagine that walk to that camp. Oh God, we're going to die. Oh no, we're going to the enemy's camp. Oh God, we don't know. We're unclean. We're wretched. We've been rejected by our own people. Surely these people will destroy us. They don't want any part with us, but they say, what other choice do we have? They keep walking. They keep moving. I'm certain that in their mind, fear and desperation, they say, I'm not going. I'm going to turn back. But they keep walking. Why? Because they know what waits them at their home. Right. But they don't know what awaits them over across that hill in the enemy's camp. Certainly they thought, well, the, 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 the odds are against us. They're going to kill us. They're going to get rid of us. But ultimately, what other choice did they have? They got desperate. They got to a place in their life where they said, you know what? I'm tired of sitting here the way I've been living. I'm tired of being rejected. I'm tired of starving to death. It's bad enough that I'm leprous, that I have all this disease that's rotting my flesh, but I will not die in my starvation. One day they came to that realization and they made the decision that they would no longer hide in fear. They would step out in faith. And so that's our lesson text. I want to do a little background here. The king of Israel is Jehoram. He's the brother of Azariah who died childless and both of them the sons of Ahab and Jezebel which were kings that ruled in Samaria. In the 24th verse of the chapter 6 of 2 Kings we are introduced again to Ben-Hadad II the king of Syria and he has brought a host of his army. We read about this in 2 Kings chapter 6. And they have shut up Samaria. And the famine is so indescribably terrible in Samaria that in the 25th and following verses, these are the things that we read. So tragic is the starvation of these people that are under siege that they sell an ass's head for four score pieces of silver, a very high price for one of the least desirable portions of meat from an animal that would not have commonly been eaten to begin with. They were starving to death. Right. They sold doves dung for food for five cents. They're eating dung and they're selling undesirable meat one to another just trying to sustain themselves. 
They're trying to live one day to the next. The enemy is out on the outskirts, and he has shut up their city. They can't get supplies. They can't get provision. The enemies come against them, and they're starving to death. Then we read the story of a woman who cries unto the king as he passes by on the wall. They're looking for the king for leadership. They're looking for him to give them an answer. How are we going to be able to sustain ourselves? And then they share a very dark and very sad testimony. This woman by my side has a little son, she says, and I have a little son. And in our distress, we agreed that one day we would boil my son and eat him. Right. And then the next day when we would boil her son and eat him, and we boiled my son and ate him, and the next day when we were to boil her son, she hid her son. Uh -huh. This woman got her belly full on my child, but now she hasn't lived up to her end of the bargain. I was willing to make such a great sacrifice because my hunger was so great and so desperate. Desperate people resort to desperate things when they come That's to right. these kinds of situations. Oh, King, it's unjust that she's hidden her son when we agreed. I've lost my love, my life, and she has hidden her son. The Bible says when the king heard of the cannibalism of his people, eating their own flesh and blood, that he rent his clothes. He ripped his clothes. He went into a process of mourning. He couldn't give an answer. He didn't know where the answer was coming from. He himself, a wicked king, grown up in a wicked household, worshiping many, many gods. Ultimately, the prophets had come to the house of Ahab and the house of Jezebel and said, Turn from your wicked ways, or God will send this upon you and your children and your kingdom. But they did not listen. And now we have the sons that are following the example of their dad and their mom. They are going into evil, idolatry, and wickedness. And ultimately we see that it's playing out exactly what the prophets had foretold. You're going to go through dark and desperate times if you do not lead your people back to God, the Almighty God. He rent his clothes. What else could he do? What he says is that... What we see is that Elisha had come to him, the unbelieving king, the son of a murderer, and he said, if you will trust God, God will give you abundance. But he had never trusted God for his abundance. If, if you will trust in him, God will deliver you. The prophet had said over and over and over again, the mercies of God never exhausted, it seems. Every year, one man would come and say, if you'll turn back to God, God will heal. He will hear. He will heal your land. Read the words of Solomon as he dedicated the temple to the altar. Almighty. He said, if your people will hear, and if they will pray towards this place, then will you hear from heaven? And God confirms that he will do just that. Those people which are called by my name, I will hear them. If they turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Amen. So since that time, God inspired a man, and he came and said, this is what's going to happen if you don't do this. This is what's going to happen if you don't do this. And here they are, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king. And then ultimately we see that they have turned their face from God. And so eventually God turns his face from them. Instead of the king becoming repentant and saying, God, I realize now the words of your inspired prophet and I repent on behalf of my people. We see evidence in the forefathers of the king of Israel. We see David and how he repented and turned the death angel away. If this king would have just reached back into his own heritage, into his own family, and if he would have seen how his forefathers dealt with God and dealt with tragedy, then he would have had an example so that he could go before God and say, God, please heal this land. Please destroy the enemy of your people. And God, we will turn to you and I'll lead this people in repentance. What did this king do? He's ready to kill Elisha. He's ready to kill the messenger because the messenger brought this desperate news. So he's ready to find him and kill him. He sends out messengers. They won't have them. So the king himself comes and stands before Elisha. And Elisha this time says something different. He says, by this time tomorrow, there shall be a measure of fine flour, three gallons sold for a few cents. And there shall be two measures of barley, six gallons of barley sold for the same amount, a few cents. What he was saying is God's getting ready to do a miracle, king. Right. If you'll just trust in what my word is, God's going to do a miracle, king. Right. The Bible says it was greeted with open ridicule. 
His king, his messengers, his people had just walked through a city where mothers are eating their own children, where they're selling for very high dollar amounts undesirable portions of meat, where they're selling dung and they're eating dung. They're eating dirt, dung, anything they could find to try to sustain themselves. He had seen the ugliness of sin in a very real and natural way. And here you are telling me that God's going to do a miracle. And this time tomorrow, we'll be eating like we didn't eat before this famine happened. Right. He didn't want to hear the good news. That's right. Because he was too wrapped up in the bad news. That's right. In the physical, we need things. We lust for things. We have desires, and if we don't put those foolish desires under subjection to the natural desires of the physical man, then we will find nothing but foolishness, and we will find nothing but death and evil and sin lying in wait for us. But ultimately, the natural man has needs, and food is one of the needs of the natural man. And he's watched, as any of us would have, walked through a city full of desperation. It's hard to have faith in the bad times. It's easy when all the bills are paid and when everyone's eating good, sitting at the dinner table. But it's awful hard to find God when it seems that God's nowhere to be found. Through our physical eyes, we look and we see prosperity, and we say, oh, God must really be blessing that person. Through the physical eyes, we look and we see money, we see finance, we see the economy, we see food, we see material things, and we go, my goodness, God sure is blessing. But through the eyes of the Spirit, God sees us, and he condemns us as being naked and wretched, and you think you have everything, and you're comfortable, but you have nothing. Through physical eyes, this king walked, and he saw evil being happening upon his people. And whether he desired what's best for those people or what's best for himself, we are left to guess for ourselves. But what we know is when he had the opportunity to repent before the times got tough, he didn't do it. And now we see that through the most desperate and dark hours in his kingdom, yet still he has not bowed himself and repented for his people. Ultimately, what we see is a prophet with a word of mercy from the almighty God, and he laughs it to scorn. He's comfortable. What do you mean he's comfortable, Brother Mark? Starving his people, starving. He's, he's come to accept certain things. God's not hearing what we say. or God's not a friend of Israel anymore. What, could we know what he meant or, or what he thought? No, we don't. The Bible doesn't say. Yeah. But put yourself in his shoes. Put your home in his home. Put your country in his country. You saw all this evil taking place upon God's people. And God no longer hears what you have to say. How would you feel? Would you accept the words from some prophet that was speaking alone? Preachers countless times get up and they preach prosperity. They preach good times. They preach it's all going to be great. The greatest life you'll ever have is living for Jesus Christ. You never hear them preach not one sermon about how difficult it can be. You never hear them preach one sermon about temptation and evil that comes against the home if you don't repent. You don't even hear the word repent in most churches today. Heaven forbid we require you to do something or to change your life or to be obedient to Scripture or to do what God's asked you to do. You never hear that preached today because it's not a popular message. We're living in the time of plenty. We're living in the land of milk and honey. God has blessed us to live in the greatest country on the face of the planet in prosperity, in innovation. America cannot be matched. America has changed the world in 200 years in ways that thousands of years of humanity has never changed the world. America, the economy that the Americans produced has lifted more people in the world out of poverty than any other economy on the face of the planet. And ultimately, when we look through physical eyes, we see the blessings of God all around us, and yet through misery we complain. And through spiritual eyes, God says, you have nothing. And here we are today. Here we are today. So the king gets a message. God's going to do something great. And he ridicules the message. Now this is the introduction to the story. We've read the backstory, What they had gone through. So God could have used a king if the king had been willing. Send out an emissary. Send out an ambassador. Just see if God's going to do what he promised to do through the prophet. We don't even read where that happened. But what we do see is God stirs up four leprous men. Four outcasts. Four people that the world said would be no good. They were not useful. But ultimately he stirs up their hearts and finally one day 
this next day, they say, you know what? I'm tired of sitting around here just dying. Right. I'm tired of sitting here. If it means I'm going to die, fine. I'm dying anyway. Ultimately, let's go out yeah. into the enemy's camp. They didn't hear the prophecy that had been given to the king. They didn't hear from their own ears what Elisha had told to the man. They ultimately decided for themselves, stirred up. I'm tired of living the way I've been living. And ultimately, if there's one message I hope this morning that we will all get inside of our hearts is I'm tired of living the way that I've been living. Whether I sit in the comforts of my own home and die or I go out and make something of my life and die, at the end of my life, it's going to be death. Nothing has changed since pestilence has come upon us. The Bible told us and foretold us these things are coming. The Bible tells us a very dark prescription about the end of time when people are so far from God that they destroy themselves. They destroy themselves. They no longer listen for a prophet. They no longer listen to a preacher. They no longer read the word of God for themselves. They no longer want to hear the truth. They'll hear a great motivational speech. They'll be encouraged. They'll even throw a little money in the offering pan if you make them feel good about living as sinful people. That's where we are today. Don't step on my toes, man of God. Don't tell me God's willing to do something when my whole life's been a mess. You know there are people today that will come up and they really have had tragedies happen in their life. They've lost loved ones. Loved ones have abandoned them. They've gone through divorce. They've gone through hardship. They've gone through disease. And then when you come with them and you give them a positive word, yeah. God revealed to me that he's going to do something great in your life. They won't hear it. That's right. No way. Right. You're so right. No way. God's abandoned me. It's just by the grace of God that I walk through the, the doors every Sunday. There are people that if you could see who they really are on the inside, you would weep openly. Because we put on our face and we come to church and we smile and we hug necks and shake hands and we love people. We send out an encouraging card from now and then. We try to give people the best side of us, but deep down and inside of us, there's brokenness and there's hurt and there's loneliness. And the Bible says this is what the church is all about. Get together and express that hurt and express that loneliness. Love somebody. Encourage somebody. This church, this body of believers here today, you are equipped by the power of God to exhort one another. They know it's going to be hard. The Bible knows this. And ultimately it says, but you're never be alone as long as you're in the church of the living, the living, the living God, the God that is on the throne, the God that could heal us from this disease, the God that can destroy famine and pestilence, the God that will come one day and take us out of this mess. He is alive and he is well. So my trust and my faith says this, God knew it before it came. And my faith in God is this, that he's going to use this in some way to do a great work for his kingdom. And ultimately, whatever that might be, if that may be more online viewers, we'll take it. If that may be the church bursting at the seams whenever people get comfortable enough to get out of their homes and come through those doors, then we'll take it. But ultimately, we've got to be prepared to be that one man of God that tells a king or a president or a mayor or a teacher, a school superintendent, whomever. God's going to do a great work and a great blessing. Even if they laugh, even if they turn their back on you, even if they say, I don't believe that nonsense, you've got to be willing to say it, and you've got to be willing to stand your ground. Never have I been so disappointed in so many people that I love and appreciated when I see their lack of faith through this crisis, and I'm just going to leave it at that. I have seen people that have preached powerfully across pulpits how God's a healer, how God does miracles, how God is a God of faith. And if you have faith and if you trust in him, blinded eyes are open. The dead shall rise again. I hear them preach these kinds of things, and now they won't even darken the door of a church. Amen. Either God's a healer or he's not. Either God's a miracle worker or he's not. Either God will do what he said he would do, or God's a liar, and we don't deserve to give him honor and worship nonetheless. I am Pentecostal. I am apostolic. I believe that the gifts continue. I believe in miracles. And I know that I know that I know that God will do what he 
said he will do. And I'm willing to stake my life on that. That's the difference. Now, is there anything special about me? No. It's just that I've come to the realization early on that one day I'm going to die of something. Whatever that might be. And God knows what that may be. I don't consider it tempting God when I decide to live my life in the way that I've always lived my life, being a proud American and a Christian at that. And I don't call that temptation. I call that me being unwilling to change my life because of something that has less than 1% death rate. Right. You watch your news and you get the daily body count. You get so stirred up. You get angry. You get frustrated. I didn't intend to go here, but I feel to go here. Forgive me. But ultimately, you watch every day your daily body count. How many people died in car accidents yesterday? Right. If I ask all of you, how many have you know per someone personally that died in a car? Each and every one of you would raise your hands. Yet and still, we all drove cars to get here today. How many times have we read about plane crashes? Have we read about shark attacks? Have we read about people getting run over? Have we read about people dying of diseases from certain uh, bodies of water? Yet and still, everybody's gone on three vacations this summer because they had the opportunity because they couldn't go to work. Right. And thank God the beaches were open. Go to work, go to church. Ultimately, we can't go to school. We can't go to church. We can't go anywhere in which we might be enriched. But we can go to Walmart six days a week, check out the clearance rack, check out the aisle. We can do all of these things. But ultimately, we, we can't live for God. I read a very, very disturbing survey this last week, and it's got me stirred because it shows that it, they've done surveys through this pandemic, how many people are actually watching online services? And those that are actually watching online services, how long are they watching? Are they watching the entire service? What you saw, what I saw was very disturbing. It said that most young people have disengaged from the church completely. You get on Facebook and it shows us a thumbs up. We got another viewer. What it don't show us is you stayed on there for one minute and then you left. So we see 300 viewers. Wow, we've really done something. Somebody tuned in for the song service because, man, them, them Pentecostals, they know how to sing. They know how to worship. Ooh, I love to hear them sing. And then when the man of God steps up to get the word from the Lord, they cut it off. I don't want to hear the preacher. Yet and still we consider ourselves being persecuted. These people are eating their children. They're starving to death. They don't know what else to do and we're being persecuted by a virus that says you're going to get it. That's what it says. Now listen to me now. You, someone in your home is going to get this virus. But you're going to recover. That's what it says. Okay? So take all this nonsense that you're listening to and just put it to the side. Just forget about it. If God kills me tomorrow with coronavirus, don't say he had a lack of faith. Just say that that was his time to go and God be worshipped, give God the glory. Because ultimately God has a plan for my life, he has a plan for your life, he has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And it's time that we no longer live in fear. Praise the Lord. When God says something, God does something. When God makes a promise, God immediately begins to work to bring it to pass. The Lord made that sieging army of Syria to hear the noise of on Russian horses. They didn't even see an army. They heard an army. God stirred up over 100,000 men of the opposing force. And he thought, they thought, they assumed for themselves, oh no, this king of Israel, he's hired these foreign powers to come and to destroy us. And because of something that they heard, even though they didn't see it, they got so scared that they left and they were so terrified that they left everything behind. They left the horses. They left the weapons. They left all the gold, the silver. They left all the, the meat. They left everything behind. They were so afraid. That's God performing a miracle. I'm going to say that again. That's God performing a miracle. Right. No man could have done what God did. But God performed a miracle. And so ultimately we see that they've all left. Right. They have run to the Jordan, leaving everything they have behind. They're all on the other side, fleeing for their lives, frightened like sheep, the Bible tells us. Now we look at Samaria. They go to bed that night for fear. There's not an enemy soldier for miles around them, but yet still they go to bed one more night in fear. And they're starving to death. And there is the abundance for an army of 100,000 men right outside the gate. 
Yet and still, they go to bed in fear and starving. They don't have enough faith to walk over that hill and look into the enemy's camp. They can't even see it with their natural eyes. They've got to do something. Do you know that if they would have just sat there and said, God's going to do something, God's going to perform a miracle, and they had never walked to that camp, they would have all starved to right. death. But God required them to do something, just like God requires you to do something today. He requires you to read the Word and to be obedient to the Word. If the Word says you'll do it, God will do it. We don't know how He'll do it. We don't know when He'll do it. But we know that God will do it. I'm reminded of those three Hebrew boys that said, we know God can deliver us. We don't know if God will deliver us. But this is what we do know. We are not bowing down to your image. And so ultimately, we have to decide for ourselves every day of our lives whether we are going to live according to the word of God or whether we are going to live according to the word of men. And so when you look at that from that perspective, nothing in your life has changed. Nothing. Every day you leave your home under the threat of death. You don't know that you'll wake up the next morning. You don't know that somebody may break into your home throughout the night. These are hard things, but ultimately I pray none of these things ever happen to you. But the point is you are not guaranteed tomorrow. That's what the Bible says. The Bible gives us parables and examples. It tells us about a rich man that's ready to build bigger barns. And then we see that he gets a very grim word tonight. Yes, Your life is required of you. Yes, Here you are building your kingdom. Here you are building up all this riches and all this, thing, all this money. But ultimately, do you know what? Tonight you're out of here. Those are the things that God tells us in his word. God's word in no place tells us we're going to be millionaires, we're going to be rich. In no place in his word does it tell us that we're going to be healthy all of our lives. In no place in his word does it tell us that our family will not be stricken. Does it not tell us that ultimately every man will die? But what it does tell us is more, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. Because it tells us that God will be with us. And that when we do taste that ultimate, ultimate situation, when we do finally succumb to the grave, if the Lord doesn't come back first, that God's prepared a place for us. Amen. And he could not lie. He would not lie. I'm going to come get you. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you, Jesus said, but it's true, and I'm coming to get you. One day, you will be with me. That's what he said. In our flesh, we look at our natural circumstances, and we think this is what's most important. Look through the eyes of the Spirit, and we see heaven. We see the Holy Ghost. We see multitudes singing in unison to worship the Almighty God in the prism of heaven. We see heaven and earth reunited in a perfect earth and a perfect heaven. We see the man, Jesus Christ, coming, returning through the clouds in victory, riding the horse and destroying the enemies of Israel and the enemies of the church, taking the church out of this mess, victorious, and then we shall live as kings and priests. The Bible says that. So ultimately, are we living like kings and priests? Are we living in faith? Are we living in encouragement? Are we encouraging ourselves in the Lord? I know it looks bad, God, but I'm going to worship you anyway. I know it's difficult, God. I never thought my life would be this difficult. But God, I'm going to worship you anyway. Just think about it this way. Think about your natural father or your natural protector, whoever that may have been in your life. Think about what would have happened if your father could come against you and discipline you in some way. And think about that time when the discipline finally broke and the mercy of your father overwhelmed him. That boy needs 39 lashes, but I could only give him 10. I love him so much. My children, my ultimately my wife, or my, my, my grandmother, my dad, they would say this hurts me more than it will hurt you. And I now know what that means. Because ultimately it destroys my soul to have to correct my children. But ultimately I know that if I don't do that, they'll grow up to be undisciplined monsters. And the Bible doesn't say you spoil your children by not disciplining your children. It says you hate them. What that means is you're not going to give them the life that they should have had. They're not going to grow up to be disciplined, responsible citizens in the earth. And they're going to destroy themselves because they have not learned discipline. So could it be that our Heavenly Fathers look down upon a very rebellious nation that destroys its children one by one, that promotes all kind of alternative lifestyles and ugliness and sin on every corner and has abandoned God and says, if I don't discipline them, then they're going to destroy themselves. You have a Heavenly Father.
father that loves you. And part of love is discipline. I used to tell myself when my children were small and I'd have to correct them, spank them or whatnot. Immediately after that, they would come and hug me. And I'm thinking, the same one that brought the pain to them, the same one that corrected them, they're now showing this love back to me. If you want to see the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to see the heart of our God, look at children. And Jesus himself told us, he said, unless you become like them, you will in no wise see the kingdom of heaven. He says, you've got to be like them. What does that mean? Totally dependent on God. Totally dependent on God. If my child eats, I feed him. If he has a roof over his head, I put a roof over his head. The clothing that he wears out and about, I provide, I provide those for him. If he gets ill, I have medication. I buy over the counter, whatever, to take care of my child. Until we as adults can put ourselves back into the mind of a child and say that I don't know how I'm going to do this or that or this. But God knows, and God knows what's best for me, and God has done miracles in my life. I remember that time when I was rebellious, and I didn't do right, but that man told me if I wanted a new life, get in the baptismal pool, and God did a miracle. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. I've seen my own personal miracle. I remember that time when my child was desperately ill. And in the midnight hour, I bowed my knee and said, in the name of Jesus. And that's all it took. And that child rose up again, full, faculty and all, and was miraculously healed. And ultimately, I go back, and I go back, and I go back to those times. And I say, God, you did it once, and you'll do it again. So, God, I'm going to live the best life I know how to do. But I'm going to turn it all over to you. The army's abandoned. But the children of God still sleep. Not comfortably in their homes. But in the place that's comfortable to them. Even though they're starving to death. And they're fearful out of their mind. So Samaria sits silently on her hill. We see 2 Kings 7 and 12, and she's frightened. She's scared, and the people go to bed that night thinking that any hour they may fall into death by the edge of the sword. They think the army's going to come and kill us. We're starving to death. We don't know what to do. They're afraid, and nobody to make them afraid. The army's already gone, but they don't know that. They look out their doors, listen to this, and they see an invisible enemy that has them bound and they're starving to death. They can't see it. They just know it's there. And they leave out of their homes fearful that this enemy is going to destroy them. Afraid for their lives and starving to death. And here they are with abundance just over that hill. Abundance just in the enemy's camp. They just have to be willing to express a little bit of faith and shame on a king. They didn't call his people in and say, we've got a word from the man of God. We see it happening throughout the scripture. Right. We read about good kings that when the prophet gave them the word, they called the nation to repentance. Right. They exhibited faith. And we saw God ask them to do in, some, in men's eyes very foolish things. All he was asking them to do is put your faith in my plan for your life and take your faith out of your plan for your life. You may have arm, armaments. You may have things that you use. To protect yourself, God's saying, do something foolish. Right. Trust me for once. Exactly. And if you trust me, that enemy is going to be destroyed. And ultimately, we see that happen in this scripture. You would have thought that at least the king would have sent someone to investigate, if not called his people to repentance. He didn't even do that. God stirred up the hearts of the ones that were unwanted in the community. Ultimately, the four lepers sit outside the gate and say to another, this is what I'd like to ask you today. Why sit we here until we die? I read a quote here a few weeks ago and I wrote it down. I put it in my, in my phone. It says, I refuse to leave the world as I found it. And so ultimately, it's time that the church of Jesus Christ, yes, this one here in this Covington community, gets stirred up and make the same declaration. Why sit we here idly by until we die? It's time that we go out into the enemy's camp and we take back what the devil stole from us. Because I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the miracles and the supernatural workings of the almighty 
God. And I refuse to continue to live scared to death. If we go into the city, these lepers tell themselves the famine is there and the gate is shut. If we sit here, we starve in agony. Let us go to the Syrians. And if they slay us, it will be better to die with one death stroke than it be to sit here this long and linger in wretchedness. They said, I'd rather die quickly than die slowly. Do you know when you were born, the clock of your life started? And every day since that time, those hands are getting a little bit closer to when you're going to go and meet your reward. So ultimately, we are all dying. We are all lepers. And so ultimately, we've got to start looking up and our situation through eyes of spirit, through eyes of faith, and not through the natural eye. If you look at what you naturally need, then the world is a very scary and a very desperate place. But if you look at it through your spiritual eyes, you see Jesus is coming soon. They're destroying each other on the, in the cities. They're burning them down. But Jesus is coming soon. The stores are not stocked with groceries. But Jesus is coming soon. Ultimately, through the eyes of the Spirit, we can write as those that wrote, as John wrote the book of Revelation. You know what his ultimate summary sentence was? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I've written things that are scary. I've seen visions that I don't even understand. I've written what you told me to write, write, and I didn't write what you told me not to write. But God ultimately, as he summarized his work, and he put it out for the church of the ages to read, he said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's our same model. That's our same declaration today. Through eyes of the Spirit, you want to be home with God, your Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. There's only one way that you're going to get there. That means something is going to take you out of this life. I don't know what it is. And I pray it be 50 years from now. 100 years for the younger among us. But ultimately know this. God has a plan for your life. Or you wouldn't have woken up this morning. God has a plan for you to do something for him. To inspire your family. To stir up something in this community. So that people will stop looking at their circumstances through selfish eyes. And will start looking at their circumstances through the eyes of of the spirit. Thank you, Lord. So these lepers, they go. They said, why sit here until we die? And then they say, let us arise and go. So they made a decision. They go. You know, that's a pretty good question for us to think about. And ultimately, to make the decision that we also should go. Four miserable men in their despair driven to the camp of what they think is a merciless and a cruel enemy. And there is no century that challenges them, we see. There is no death stroke that falls upon them, we read. And they come into the first part of the camp and the second part, and there is abundance and abundance and abundance. Imagine the courage that it took for them to walk to the camp. But now look at the reward of their faithfulness. They walked and they found that everything they could have hoped for in abundance is available to them. And so we see, and these are one of, this is one of the stories that I, I kind of snicker a little bit about because I see that they do just like we do. They go eat to their full. They start hiding stuff for themselves. It's like a party's going on. Well, we've never been this blessed in all of our lives. They thought they were going to die. And a few, a day later or whatever the case, however long it took them to walk to the enemy's camp, they get there and they go, oh, God is good. And in a matter of moments, those that were dying and those that were cursing God because they were leprous and because they were destroyed with this disease, the people of God had rejected them. They were told they were unclean. They were told to cry out to the healthy ones. Don't get around me. I'm different. I'm not useful for you. Ultimately, their life had been a one where they had to eat garbage. They were quarantined from the rest of the children of Israel. They, we see their time has finally come. Their ship has come in. God is good, and he has blessed me beyond measure. So they, here they are. They're, they're hiding the good stuff, and they're going around there eating. They're feasting. They're enjoying themselves. And finally, one of them says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. This is not good. This is not well. So they had a little bit of morality about it, just enough to know that we need to go tell our brothers and sisters yeah. what they we have discovered. Enjoy. That they too might be blessed. Because no doubt they had heard the words of those that were so desperate in that city. Otherwise they would have thought there'd be food there. 
No one challenges them. They go, they eat, and they enjoy the fruits of their faithfulness. Ultimately, it says that they, ultimately they said one to another, this is not well come. This is a day of good tidings. Let us tell the king. No longer starving, no longer shut up. Why God has the, God has opened the windows of heaven and they go to the gate and they call for the porter. So they, just think about that. In a matter of a short span of time, their life is completely changed for the better. The most desperate time has become the time of abundance and blessing, and I believe God can do that today. I believe God will turn desperate times into blessings. Why? Because the Bible shows me in every case where there is a great, great sentence upon God's people that he would come and reverse course or that he would send mercy or that ultimately he would allow them to find comfort and mercy living in circumstances that were beyond their control. His people were faithful people. They went and they, they made bad decisions many times, but ultimately they lived just like we, we live. We're human beings. But they knew ultimately before the time of their life was over that their blessings came from Almighty God. Whether we eat good today, and most of us will, I don't think any of us are hungry. Ultimately, we all have enough money to put fuel in our tanks. We leave out of our homes. We're able to be here. We're able to go other places. But ultimately, none of us have experienced the persecution that we will experience. We will experience in the coming days ahead. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be. But if you read the Bible, the book of prophecy, you read Revelation, you look at Ezekiel, you look in the book of Daniel, you read it with understanding, you see that before this thing gets better, it's going to get much worse. And that ultimately the people that have known so much, that have had so much in abundance, that are now scared to death, will ultimately see that there are going to be some very challenging, desperate and difficult times ahead for God and for his people. But ultimately we look through eyes of, of faith today, through eyes of the spirit, and we know that when it's all done, Jesus Christ is coming. The Bible says we have one reward, and it's Jesus Christ. And it says that when you see all this evil, rejoice. Rejoice. When you see all this evil coming, it's rejoice. Why? Because God is coming soon. And so ultimately just realize that when we see these things happening that we've preached about, we've taught about, we've read about some of us for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, whatever the case. When we see those things happening, rejoice because your redemption draws me. Jesus is coming. And one day he's going to say, this is enough. He says that there will be no tears in eyes. He will comfort those that need comfort. And those that didn't have much in this earth will be provided plenty. You'll be kings and priests. You'll have a mansion. You will see your fortune change in a very short spirit, period of time. People that are dying today because of ravaging diseases, whatever the case, that are going through natural death, whatever it may be. People that are dying today are going to see a reversal when they breathe their last breath here and their spirit is in the presence of the Almighty God, they will know it has all been worth it. So the most desperate time of their life will very quickly become the most gracious and pure and perfect time of their life because their faith was not without fail. They lived according to the Word of God. They didn't understand it when these things came against them. They didn't understand it when people came against them unjustly and unfairly. They believed that God would deliver them, but you know what? God didn't deliver them this time. But what they found was that God did indeed deliver them. He didn't deliver their physical body. He gave them the greatest of all promises, and they were seen it with their own eyes. All those things about heaven and a mansion and miracles and that my body's going to be healed and made perfect. One day when my spirit's rejoined with that perfect body and the earth is remade in a perfect way and heaven and earth are remade and there's a new Jerusalem. You read about it in the book of prophecy. Ultimately you see in Revelation that these things will come to pass because the prophecy of the Bible has never failed. The archaeology of the Bible has never failed. When men have challenged the history contained in its pages, they have done it foolishly because years pass and they find out they were wrong and the Bible was right. And so what I'm asking today is men and women that you be people of faith and that you exercise that faith in God, that you look at life through eyes of the Spirit, not through eyes of the flesh. Don't let the enemy tell you that he's going to destroy you and allow that fear to lock you away. If that's your choice, fine, but make that choice for yourself. Don't let someone else tell you how to live. Right. Praise the Lord. 
There's one thing that really, really bothers me. And that is when people that don't know there is a God and don't believe in God tell me how to live. I don't care what they think because the Bible calls them a fool. Right. And if your foundation is wrong, then the entire structure of your understanding, the right. entire structure of your belief is going to destroy. It's going to collapse within itself. Right. You may think you stand for something. The Bible says you stand for nothing right. because the beginning of all knowledge is the knowledge that there is a God and that I'm not him and that he has a plan for my life and that I'll be obedient to his word because he's given it to me. So in summation, sin and rebellion had once again led the people of God into a place of total loss. They were surrounded and in the midst of famine and the king was desperate. The scripture speaks of economic conditions in Samaria reaching rock bottom. The people had turned to cannibalism to satisfy their hunger and they ate even their own babies. Although the king was angry with the prophet, this situation had been brought about by the king's own leadership and rebellion against the word of God. He'd been warned. The kingdom had been warned. They'd been told that you have to live according to the promises in the word of God. You have to live according to God's word. Read Deuteronomy 28 if you want to see. You know the Bible talks about blessings for kingdoms that live for God, but then it lists twice as long the curses that will come against a kingdom or a nation that refuses or rebels against God. We've got it here plainly. We can read it for ourselves. These things are not unusual to those people of faith. The king of Israel turned to the prophet Elisha for direction. Some believed the word of the Lord that came from the prophets. Others did not. They laughed. They ridiculed. They mocked. Sounds familiar. Sounds like they do to us today. They laugh. They ridicule. They mock. You are people that believe in God when we don't believe in God. They say we're so enlightened. We're encouraged. We are people that believe in natural things. That things just happen naturally. It violates every law of science and the scientific method. But they tell us we're the fools. Violates their own laws that there's no creator. But then they say there's no creator. And ultimately we buy into that foolishness and we live our best life now. You want to know why people are scared to death? Because indirectly they're convinced that this body, this life is all they have. And when they die, it's all over with. But to people of faith, we know that's not true. We know that this is just a training ground. That if we can get it right here, if we can live for God here, and we can, treat, we can choose God here, God has promised us a great blessing. This is not paradise for us, but it's paradise for them. That's the reason why they invest countless hundreds of thousands of dollars into education. They've got to get a better job. They've got to get a bigger promotion. That's the reason why they're the victim when someone gets the job that they wanted and, and they didn't get it because this is all they've got. They've got to do their best. Why do you think people are miserable in a country that teaches you have to be wealthy, you have to be famous, you have to look a certain way? They're miserable all the time because this is all they've got. Mr. Gates don't deserve $100 billion. Mr. Bezos don't deserve $150 billion. They need to give me some of that money instead of saying, oh, no, I'll work hard because God commands me to work right. hard. I'll be a man of character because God calls me to be a man of character. If God blesses me with abundance, praise God. If I have nothing, praise God because one day I'm going to be with Jesus, and that's what matters best. Amen. I'm going to be with Jesus. If that's tomorrow, if that's next week, if that's next year, I am going to be with Jesus. That is the blessed hope. You know where that term comes from, the blessed hope? It's that one day Jesus is going to park in clouds. And he's going to come back and he's going to get us out of this mess. And men that sought with their own hands to build governments and sought to control one another with war and, and, and desperate ways, they tried to keep people submitted. Man thought they could do it without God, but there's going to be a day when God's going to say, that's enough. I'm tired of my church being persecuted. I'm tired of them going through literal hell on earth by their own hands. They are destroying themselves. It is finished. He said those words on the cross when he destroyed sin for each and every human being that would choose to accept him. No matter your race, no matter your culture, no matter where you're from, the, the, the prescription is the same, Acts 2.38. I've seen those that speak English speak in tongues. I've seen those that speak Chinese speak in tongues. The language is the same. You want to come to know God, you will repent. Be baptized in Jesus' name, and you will, I'm going to say it again, you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of God for your life. 
And when that happens, Paul says, you want to know what the Holy Ghost is? It's a down payment. It's the earnest of your inheritance. It's God pouring out just a little bit of favor. That euphoria you feel, that feeling that there's not a care or a problem in the world where we dance and we shout and we run aisles and we speak in other tongues and we don't care who sees or who worships with us. We just do it because God's worthy of that worship. We do that. And Paul says, you know what? That's just a little bit of what you get ready to experience. Just a down payment. Now, history says that because Paul was a Roman citizen, he couldn't be crucified. He couldn't be killed in any certain way. He had to be killed in a certain respectful way. So history tells us he had his head cut off. Right. History also tells us that he ran toward the guillotine. That's right. He ran toward the machine, the instrument that would cut off his head. Because he had written letter after letter, hope after hope from prison cell. He, read, he even told us his testimony. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been destroyed, stoned. He had been left for dead. But ultimately, he said, in my physical body, I couldn't find myself to worship God. But you know what? In my private prayer time, I spoke and I groaned in the spirit. I didn't even know I didn't pray with understanding. My spirit prayed. Because in those times, I didn't have the words. I was so desperate. I was so hungry for the presence of God. I didn't know what to say. All of his eloquence, him knowing the first five books of the law, a scholar, a PhD, in his day, he didn't have the words. And then he himself said, I come to you, not as a man, but in the power of God. There are some things you'll just never understand. There are some people that your words will just never reach them. You'll never persuade them. Right. But when they see how you live for God, right. they hear you pray, yeah. and you pray with a love and an affection for God, knowing that you're going to be with Him Praise one day. That's what our world needs today. Amen. They don't need a solution to all the problems in the world. They don't need more money. They don't need better health care. They need a fresh anointing from the Almighty God. And when they receive that, then they will see that the power of God is real. And when we do what we're supposed to do as the church of the living God, we will be the ones that bring about revival in America. If you would stand, I'd like to pray for you. Praise the Lord. Today we live in uncertain times. And through our natural eyes, we see things that just don't make sense. God told us that we would do great and victorious things. He said he would always be with us, the comforter, rest inside each and every one of our hearts. But in our own limited understanding, we have solutions to these problems, and we say, if it was me, I would do it this way, or I would do it that way. I'll end with this scripture. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It shouldn't surprise any of us that God works in unexpected ways. God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of your family. He's going to bless you. If you'll just have the faith to believe in him and to trust in his word, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for these precious people, Lord. I pray, God, that I have not overstepped my bounds. I pray that I have not hurt anybody. God, that is not in my heart, and, and you know that. I pray today, Lord, as I prayed often, that the words that I say would be inspired and anointed because they come from the Scripture, not because of me. These people didn't come to hear me, Lord Jesus. They came to hear from you. And I pray today, God, that they will leave this place changed, transformed, and anointed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you.